Well, hi, everybody. I'm Don Stewart, and welcome to another edition of Your Bible Questions Answered. This is the program where we take the questions you've been asking me and answering one every day. In the morning, we do breaking news, and in the afternoon, Your Bible Questions Answered. Now, this one comes to me quite often, and it comes in various ways, but it's basically something like this. Is my life really that important to God? I mean, with all the events going on in the world, does he really care about me? How do I know that? How do I know from Scripture God cares about the things that I do uh, in my life? Now, we answer this in one of our books, What Everyone Needs to Know About the Bible, Question 2. And that's uh, is it important? And the question is, is it important to consider the claims of the Bible? Question number two. And it's reason number seven, 15 reasons why it's important to consider the claims of the Bible. And that's because the Bible tells us how God sees history, history from God's point of view. Now, this can be found, this book and all the rest of our books, free, free download on educatingourworld.com, our website. And we trust you've taken advantage of that. We have 65 books available for download. And of course, this one is under the subject of the Bible. Now, how does God see history? Now, while the Bible records the sweep of human history, it's important that we understand that the history recorded in the Bible is from God's perspective. In other words, we discover what is important to God when we study the pages of the Bible. Now, usually when we go to Israel, sometime during the time there, I'll say I've got a very important thing to say to you, one of the most fascinating, greatest verses in Scripture we're going to talk about right now. And I say, please turn to Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. And they get all excited. Everybody turns there and they think, I must be at the wrong place. This can't be what he's talking about. Well, yes, it is. In fact, we mentioned these verses yesterday, but in a different context. Let's read it again. Luke 3, uh, 3 1 to 2. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Luke 3, 1 to 2. And people say, that's exciting. I say, it certainly is. Please notice what we find here. We find seven historical figures mentioned, including who the Caesar was, the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, the various rulers, the names of the high priests. Yet we discover the only purpose for them being mentioned was to inform us about the time in history when the word of the Lord came to a man named John living in the wilderness. In other words, from God's viewpoint, it was not the ruler of the known world, the governor of a province, or the various rulers or priests that are important. No, it was a man named John through whom the word of God came. He is the one who was highlighted from God's perspective, not these other individuals who were so important at that time. God's viewpoint is certainly not the same as the viewpoint the secular world has. So we learn a valuable lesson from Luke 3, 1 to 2. You wouldn't find the names of these seven people even mentioned in Scripture unless it needs to give us a historical reference when the real story, the Word of God, came to a man named John. This is the way God is writing history. Now, there's another illustration we have here from the Old Testament, and that is the life of King Saul. It's seen from two perspectives. Another example of this can be seen in the life of the first king of Israel, Saul. The Old Testament books of 1 and 2 Samuel basically give us the secular view of history. 1 and 2 Samuel is a secular view of history. In other words, they would relate history from the vantage point of someone living at the time, kind of like the morning newspaper or things that you read online, all right, the, the stories of the day. And Saul would be a big deal. However, the book of Chronicles looks at the same events, but it does so from God's perspective, the divine view. Now, when we look at the amount of space devoted to Saul, the first king of Israel, we can see the difference between God's perspective and the human perspective. All right, first and foremost, we find that the people had demanded a king. We are told that the people of Israel came to the prophet Samuel and demanded a king. They wanted to be just like all the other nations. So the Bible explains what took place when Samuel brought their request before the Lord. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that people are saying to you. It's not that they have, it's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. This is the Lord talking. As they have done from this day, I will, as they have done from the day that I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing this to you. That's 1 Samuel 8, verses 6 to 8. So God says, by requesting a king or demanding a king of Samuel to be like the other nations, God said, this is an affront to me. 
Now notice what we see here. The prophet Samuel was displeased with their request, so he brought it before the Lord. And the Lord had told him that the people had not rejected Samuel, but actually they were rejecting him by requesting a king at that time. Therefore, we find that their choice, Saul, was not God's man for the job. This is key. He was not God's man for the job. And that's what we're going to find out. Saul is then introduced to us in the next chapter. His rule is recorded throughout the rest of the book of 1 Samuel. The last chapter records his death. Therefore, in the secular view of history, the one that chronicles the, uh, the life of Saul and his rule, there are some 23 chapters devoted to Saul, the choice of the people to be their king. He is one of the main subjects throughout the book, 23 chapters from the secular point of view. Now, how about God's view of Saul? Now, let's contrast this with God's view of history as found in 1 Chronicles. Instead of 23 chapters, we find one short chapter of only 14 verses dedicated to Saul. His epitaph at the end of the chapter reads as follows. Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. First Chronicles chapter 10, verses 13 through 14. Now, get this, the contrast could not be greater. Saul is the main character in the book of 1 Samuel, the secular view of events. Yet, in God's view, there's only one short chapter about the man. And furthermore, the only reason he is mentioned at all is to get us to David, the man whom God had chosen. Otherwise, you and I would have never heard of Saul, because from God's viewpoint, Saul was basically irrelevant. So what a great lesson this is. Uh, we would have never heard of Saul unless uh, we had the secular point of view given in the books of Samuel. So it's a great lesson for us. God's view of things are not the same as a secular view. Let us never forget it. One more example, Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7. All right, the metallic statue of, statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the story in Daniel chapter 2? Nebuchadnezzar has this dream that's bothering him. He knows it means something, but he's not quite sure what it means. And so he asks his soothsayers, his magicians, and all the wise men of Babylon to tell him two things. Tell him what he dreamt and what the dream meant. And they said, oh, King, you'll just tell us what you dreamt, and we'll tell you what it meant. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no, it doesn't work that way. You tell me what I dreamt as well as what I, it meant. And they said, look, nobody can do that. No human being can do this. And Nebuchadnezzar basically said, I thought you were in touch with the gods. You would be able to do that if you were. So he ordered them all to be put to death. And unfortunately, Daniel was part of that category. He was raised among the leaders of uh, Babylon when it come to learning the wisdom of Babylon. Now, he wasn't there at the, to the king at that time, but he would have uh, and his friends been put to death too. So when he heard it, he asked for, asked for time to pray to God. And God gave him the revelation, not only of what Nebuchadnezzar dreamt, but what it meant. So he came into Nebuchadnezzar, he was brought in there, and Nebuchadnezzar says, can you, you know, tell me this? And Daniel says, no, no human being can, but there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he's going to tell you what's going to happen after these things, the things you were dreaming about. And Nebuchadnezzar was dreaming about uh, who, you know, his kingdom and what would happen afterwards. And so that's where he got the vision of the great metallic statue, four different metals, a head of gold, chest and arms of cellar, uh, silver, belly and thigh of bronze, and legs of iron and toes of iron mixed with clay. And basically what uh, he was told, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, there's going to be four successive kingdoms until the fifth kingdom comes, the kingdom of God to the earth. And they're going to, each is going to be inferior to the previous one. And he said, you are the head of gold after you. We're told in the book of Daniel, it's going to be the Medes and the Persians, which it was. Then Greece, which uh, basically conquered the Medes and the Persians. And the fourth king, and, uh, the name is not mentioned, but it was the Roman Empire. And so uh, this huge, huge thing about these great kingdoms that are come on the earth. And, you know, they're going to have the awe and splendor of that. And so this is the secular point of view, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now, what's interesting, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel receives a vision of the four kingdoms. And notice something very important. The vision was not of these great, magnificent kingdoms, a beautiful statue gleaming in the sun. The vision was from a four wild beast, four horrible beasts. And that was God's viewpoint of the world kingdoms until the kingdom of God comes to earth. In other words, they were they didn't have this great majestic aura about them. 
They were secular, they were awful, and they were basically doing things that, uh, you know, did not honor the God of heaven. And what's also interesting, too, when we read this, and we make a big deal about this, and we have and we will continue to, the emphasis in God's perspective was not on Nebuchadnezzar, but it was on the fourth kingdom, and that's the Roman Empire. A great majority of Daniel 7 was talking about the fourth kingdom, this beast that's indescribable, Rome, because that's where God's perspective is, because it's the time of this fourth kingdom. In fact, Daniel 2.44 says the same thing, but the time of the, this fourth kingdom, uh, when the word of God tells us that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ will come back. God's kingdom will be set up during that particular time. That's when God's kingdom comes to earth. But isn't it interesting that what we find here in God's perspective, just like we found with Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the seven names are mentioned only to get to uh, the man named John. It's the same thing we see with Saul and David. Saul is only mentioned in Chronicles, the godly point of view just to get to King David from the secular point of view 23 chapters he's the big story but not from God's point of view and finally in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 we have this you know the secular point of view in Daniel 2 these great magnificent kingdoms and God's point of view that is four lousy evil beasts that basically will set the stage for the coming of the fifth kingdom the kingdom of God to the end of the world and the world that we know it as it is. The world will not end in the sense that there'll be no more world. The world will end this present sinful world where there be God's kingdom coming to earth. And that's the great news. So what do we learn about this? We learn from God's view of history, God's view of events, the important things today. It's not what's going on in Moscow, Washington, D.C., Tehran, uh, where it might be, Istanbul, uh, you name it, London, Iran, wherever it might be. The important things is what's going on in your life and my life. As God's writing history from his perspective, he's keeping score of what we do, how we honor him in our lives. God's view of history is basically his people, which are the highlight. Now, we'll never be big in this side of the world. We'll never be known or never hit the headlines, but that's okay. We want to hit the headlines in God's perspective. So we see from these examples, from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, from the lives of Saul. Uh, the life of Saul is given in Samuel and Chronicles. And then, of course, the uh, dream of Daniel and the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the secular versus the sacred. Where is God's emphasis? It's on his people, what they're doing. And as we've said before, the Bible is all about God working with his people. That's the main story. We are center stage on the front part of the stage. Everybody else is a bit player that comes on the scene, that comes on the stage, but the lights are always on us, the believers and the, the people of God and God himself. That's the story of history, and that's why God is interested in your life and in my life. So yeah, he does care. He's very interested. And so don't be concerned if you don't get a lot of headlines on this in this world. You want to get the headlines in the next world. God's view of history. I hope that helped out to me. It's very, very encouraging when I study this subject, and hopefully it was to you. I'm Don Stewart. Thanks for watching, and until the next time, as always, may the Lord richly, richly bless you.